is not from foreign enemies, but from enemies within. The United States and much of the Western world is ultimately controlled by an unelected, unaccountable cabal. Its apex is the banking and financial cartel, followed by the oil cartel, the CEOs of the largest and most powerful transnational corporations, major intelligence agencies, including the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA, and a major slice of the U.S. military. Their collective power and influence is incalculable. And it is their plan for the U.S. and the rest of us that is so alarming. Their plan is an empire greater in size and power than any empire before it. They call this the New World Order, which, ironically, is the same name Hitler used for the smaller empire he imagined. One sure thing, the New World Order will end all pretense of government of, by, and for the people. It will be a dictatorship of, by, and for a small minority of the rich and privileged elite. Most of my friends, both American and Canadian, tend to agree that the world is in a state of crisis. But very few are aware that the problems are not natural phenomena. They have been engineered by a very tiny elite group of rich, ruthless, and power-hungry people who have been deliberately keeping the majority of decent, hard-working taxpayers totally in the dark. The so-called black budget has never been shown to the public until now. Since 1996, the Pentagon has spent $8.5 trillion in taxpayer money that has never been accounted for. Every year, hundreds of billions of Pentagon dollars go missing, not because of fraud, waste, or abuse, but because U.S. military planners have appropriated it to secretly develop advanced weapons and fund clandestine operations. A shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. Senator Daniel Inouye is speaking about the Unacknowledged Special Access Programs, or USAPs, an entity that uses taxpayer dollars but is not beholden to domestic laws. Unacknowledged Special Access Programs are not to be confused with Special Access Programs that are acknowledged. Edward Snowden, for instance, disclosed, among other things, a program called PRISM. But PRISM was acknowledged, meaning the President, Congress, and key members of the intelligence community knew of its existence. USAPs, on the other hand are small, top-secret compartments whose very existence is not known by anyone outside the compartment. A Department of Defense manual describes USAP as follows, quote, unacknowledged SAPs require a significantly greater degree of protection than acknowledged SAPs. A SAP with protective controls that ensures the existence of the program is not acknowledged, affirmed, or made known to any person not authorized for such information. All aspects, technical, operational, logistical, are handled in an unacknowledged acknowledged manner, end quote. This means that no matter who it is, high-ranking official or otherwise, if one were to ask about such a program, one is authorized and required to deny its existence entirely. It is ironic that the U.S. should be fighting monstrously expensive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, allegedly to bring democracy to those two countries, when it itself can no longer legitimately claim to be called a democracy when trillions, and I mean thousands of billions of dollars, have been spent on projects about which both the Congress and the Commander-in-Chief have been kept deliberately in the dark. And what kind of operations would require such monumental secrecy? The Manhattan Project gave us the atomic bomb. The Genome Project gave us the human genome. The third great initiative the Connectome Project, to map the entire human brain. And that may take a quantum computer. And this means that in the future, communications could be done mentally. What I'm saying is that the internet 
will be replaced by BrainNet. For a long time now, neuroscience has been decoding and reprogramming the brain. In chimpanzee Batty, brain waves telemetered from the left and right amygdala were received and automatically analyzed by an online analog computer. This instrument was instructed to recognize a specific pattern of waves. The computer was also instructed to activate a stimulator. Each time the waves appeared, radio signals were sent to Patty's brain to stimulate a point known to have negative reinforcing properties. Electrical stimulation of one cerebral structure was contingent upon specific EEG patterns in another area of the brain. Technology has always brought man to the front of a new era. Old religions die and new religions are born. And now we all have arrived at a turning point in history. The military, you know, they pioneered the internet, DARPA, and now they are pioneering uh, our interface to our brain. And if you think the internet is big, if you think blockchain is big, this is going to blow it all away. Because there's nothing bigger than connecting our minds to the internet. Know the outcome and you see the journey. A new world order. The hardware that's coming out right now, literally as we speak, is going to blow open the doors for this. We're going to get to a whole new level. AI will take over and take our place. Today, people want to kick out this reality and usher in a new reality. A world where you can be who you want, do what you want, to who you want, without the interference or consequence of morality or God. It's a supercomputer that's attacking you. It's like a game of chess. We are entering that world of Neo-Sapiens where there is going to be a reality beyond anything any human being has experienced. There's no need for external hardware. Once we tap into the brain, our minds itself can actually cre create overlays of AR and VR. It's so seamless, the technology disappears. Erasing language barriers as we speak. We call it hallucinating, right? But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms that would give us everything AR would without any glasses. The system then takes those, those algorithms and, and, and correlates uh, communication and behavior data. When I say communication and behavior data, what I'm referring to is impulses and identifiers. Okay? Um, and then uh, that brain activity is then sampled, uh, remotely measured, and, and then integrated back into RNN data um, uh, for the purposes of uh, you know, creating a cognitive model of the victim's brain. So as we are talking, there's a certain pattern for every word we say. What they're doing is looking at the pattern in the brain, and then they're matching that pattern, uh, they're putting that into a database. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. You may be able to have algorithms sophisticated enough, and they get enough samples, enough data, that, it, that, the, that the AI could actually learn over time uh, uh, what the general rules are for different words, and then you could apply it to anybody. And that's what they're using on mind control victims and targeted individuals on a daily basis to destroy them. This whole conspiracy to enslave humanity is a psychological game. Without verbalizing anything, you could literally start to talk, communicate with other people. So my lecture, we could all be standing here silent. <laughs> and I could just be communicating it to you. Uh, you. I could be talking, you would talk to people. They could be, you could literally have conversations with people without ever getting on your phone anywhere in the world. So that when that person goes to speak out about it, when they go to seek help from their fellow human beings and their fellow human beings say, what is it that's happening to you? The target will then say, I'm hearing voices inside my head. But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms. And they will conclude that this person must be crazy. And as a result, they will recommend psychological evaluation for that person. You can see the way this is going to go and the way it is going right now. As good people, helpless people that are being abused and tortured and enslaved and experimented upon in America today, American citizens, 
cry out for help from their fellow Americans and their fellow Americans say, why don't you take some Prozac because we think you're schizophrenic. When this is a highly technical program, all of the symptoms are induced by a technology that is so fucking sophisticated, it is horrifying beyond description. We call it hallucinating, right? But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms that would give us everything AR would without any glasses. Folks, we are about to be plugged into the matrix for real. I'm not kidding. You can look around you and see it happening in real time. Our computers are upgrading their hardware like every, every month, right? It's getting better. The hardware is there's something new coming out for our computers. Our brains haven't been upgraded in over 100,000 years. But that is actually about to change. Many of the high frequency bands that we will make available for 5G currently have some satellite users, as well as some defense department applications, or at least the possibility of future satellite and defense users. This means sharing will be required between satellite and terrestrial wireless, an issue that is especially relevant in the 28 gigahertz band. But if anyone tells you that they know the details of what 5G is gonna become, run the other way. If something can be connected, it will be connected. Hundreds of billions of microchips connected in products from pill bottles to plant waterers. And that's damn important. Nano cells are real small. A thousand times smaller than these dust particulates. You inhale it, they go to work replicating, spreading like a virus, multiplying in exponentials. <laughs> Six months' time, I could have a hundred million people converted, ditch diggers, porn stars, and presidents. Not one would be the wiser. A hundred million people will buy what I want them to buy and do pretty much damn well anything I figure they ought to do. Take a look. This is the front of my pen. This amount of nanomaterial, if be able to maintain and sustain with regard to its deliverability and aerosolization, could in fact affect all of you. Um, the nanotechnology is in the bodies, uh, the brains of all 318 million Americans. Everyone's infected and in spraying the nanotechnology into the hydrosphere for the last 25 years, which filters down into the water supply and the food chain. Once ingested, the, mi the nanotech then migrates to the brain and adheres to the neurotransmitters of the victim's brain and begins to speak to and decode those neurotransmitters after it's activated. It can be activated, the nanotechnology, from thousands of miles away using a process called directed energy flash photons, okay? They illumine the brain, the brain of the victim with photons that re read the return training signal. That's how the technology can be activated in a specific target's uh, uh, brain, okay? So while you know, everyone is infected, not everyone's nanotech and everyone's brain is activated. We have reached a new milestone where four billion people are now using the internet. As these smart technologies begin to invade our homes, we are becoming mere nodes in a giant network that we yet but dimly comprehend. Called the Internet of Things, the plan is to create a network that will eventually include every single object on the planet. And as the public is finally becoming aware, such networks provide golden opportunities for corporations and governments alike to collect data and spy on the population. This is not mere conjecture. Before becoming enmeshed in an affair that ultimately derailed his career, Former CIA director David Petraeus bragged openly about how these smart technologies would allow intelligence agencies to spy on everyone in their own homes using their own appliances. Speaking at a summit for InQtel, the CIA's venture capital firm, Petraeus noted, Items of interest will be located, identified, monitored, and remotely controlled through technologies such as radio frequency identification, sensor networks, tiny embedded servers, and energy harvesters. In practice, these technologies could lead to rapid integration of data from closed societies and provide near-continuous, persistent monitoring of virtually anywhere we choose. 5G doesn't just connect smartphones. It connects the Internet of Things, anything with a chip in it. Think self-driving cars, smart cities, your body. You can be sure of only one thing. The biggest Internet of Things application has yet to be imagined. The outcome is that they want to connect the human brain to artificial intelligence, so artificial intelligence becomes human consciousness. It is called the sentient world simulation. The program's aim, according to its creator, 
is to be a continuously running, continually updated mirror model of the real world that can be used to predict and evaluate future events and courses of action. In practical terms, that equates to a computer simulation of the entire planet, complete with billions of nodes representing every person on the Earth. Imagine what would happen if we had to link thousands of brains together. Just like nature creates a superior intelligence by forming flocks, schools, shoals, and swarms, we could create the brain of brains, the world's first ever human quantum computer. Well, what if we told you we already have? What they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important. It's the crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? The types of approaches that people are taking now to build intelligent machines benefit immensely from what this machine that we've built does best. So what this center is about is applying this beautiful new computational idea in the service of trying to make intelligent machines. Your brain is remotely tied, the cerebral cortex is remotely tied to a supercomputer for life. And what happens when we ultimately reverse engineer the brain and develop a machine that has cognitive capability and emotional capability? Before you go, oh, that's the stuff of science fiction. No, it's not. You cannot compromise. You cannot negotiate, you cannot surrender to a computer. It will continue to do what it is programmed to do. Linking brains to machines and creating machine brains. Is that something we can handle? Mind transfer, mind copying, whole brain emulation, except for the purposes of training, research, and development. Stuff of science fiction? Nope. It's called the information and injection feedback loop. It's bidirectional so they can upload, download, at the speed of light. The system can. This information injection feedback loop, this neural link between the victim's brain and the supercomputer. Linking brains to the internet and data clouds that make an unlimited amount of information available to us all the time. Yeah, we can do these kind of things. Your brain is remotely tied, the cerebral cortex is remotely tied to a supercomputer for life, which monitors and manipulates all electromagnetic activity of the victim's brain. A machine that has cognitive capability and emotional capability literally uses the first person singular I and tells us how it feels. A real, live, breathing, sensitive and responsive entity, just like Pinocchio becomes a boy. If I stood before you three years ago and I told you this, I'd be like, here's science fiction that should start out with once upon a time. Not science fiction anymore. The ultimate issue, we handle it. Can we handle the truth that these neuroscientific questions may foster? Can we handle the answers? Can we handle the unknowns? And what do we do with that? Is that something we can handle? And even if we can, how are we going to handle it? This is that interesting point where neuroethics becomes NELSI. Neuroethics, legal, and social issues in interaction. And there were many. This is an article from 10 years ago. Sentient World, War Games on the Grandest Scale. The VOD is developing a parallel to planet Earth with billions of individual nodes to reflect every man, woman and child this side of the dividing line between reality and AR. The deep state has merged the quantum computer with the sentient world simulation. And the true reason for all this data collection is to feed it into this AI machine to predict and manipulate the course of humanity. Even now, the sentient world simulation is watching you learn about it. And inside its intelligent mind is creating a second you, running different scenarios against you to see how you react. Pattern number six, zero, one, one, nine, nine, one. Remote brain computer interface, neural monitoring. This invention relates to a system and method where brain activity of a particular individual is monitored and transmitted in a wireless manner, i.e. via satellite, from the location of the individual to a remote location so that the brain activity can be computer analyzed. 
at the remote location, thereby enabling the computer and or individuals at the remote location to determine what the monitored individual was thinking or wishing to communicate. In certain embodiments, this invention relates to the analysis of brain waves or brain activity and or to the remote firing of select brain nodes in order to produce a predetermined effect on the individual. They can not only monitor your thoughts, but they can modify your behavior remotely. Yes, we can absolutely yoke brains to machines to create these interfaces. There's a brand new DARPA project that starts this month. NESD, Neural Engineering Systems Designs. The colloquial name for that is the cortical modem. Implants in the brain that allow real-time input and output from the brain remotely. Perhaps no other area of the brain sciences has been so contemporarily provocative. The ability to peer into the living brain in real time, not just to assess its structure, but to assess its function using ever-increasing techniques that are sophisticated, to engage the granularity of the fineness of what's happening at a variety of levels, from the gross to the very local. To see what brain areas are differentially active under different conditions of thought, emotion, behavior. To then trace what brain areas are intercommunicative as we engage various things, and to use this in a way that's not only descriptive, but to increasingly use this in a way that is predictive to be able to recreate images that an individual has seen, feelings that an individual has felt, sounds, music that an individual has heard, simply from interpreting the pattern and registry of a brain scan. Remote neural monitoring is an actual military defense system using satellite tower-based platforms, mobile-based platforms, by way of you know, bioelectro-optics, virtual interfaces, and so forth brain to computer interface, electronic brain to brain interface. Remote neural monitoring is designed to, to image and measure and transmit brain and, and neural activity. In a very real sense, what we're doing is we're taking images, levels of density of light, of computational inference of each little box that's being scanned in the brain, and we're doing exactly as you're doing right here. Look at the word. Look at this word. You see a little circle, another little circle with a line, a straight line, and a little loop. And in your head, what you're saying is C-A-N, can. That means something to you. So what you're doing is you're scanning the lines, you're scanning the image, and you're reading the word. You're inferring meaning what that word is. So, are we in fact scanning the brain and reading the mind? Literally, yes, we are. Pack number 6011991, Remote Brain Computer Interface Neural Monitoring, i.e. via satellite, directed not necessarily by human handlers, but by a computer system that sits on a global information grid in a network-centric environment. They can not only monitor your thoughts, but they can modify your behavior remotely. Your brain reality is your reality. And if, in fact, I can import information into that brain and take outputs from that brain and link that to an avatar so that brain thinks that it's embodied and moving in the world and experiencing the world, can we do this? Yeah, we can do these kind of things. This is how it works. This program collects data. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing right now, this system is compiling data on you. And not just about where you are and what you are doing, but how you are feeling. Because, after all, you cannot truly have an accurate simulation without factoring in real human emotion. I can see you and hear you. I can sense your environment. And I can respond to your emotions. I guess you could say I'm putting a human face on artificial intelligence. Right now, there is a miniature digital version of you living, being in a sentient nature, in a synthetic digital environment. People, this is the Sims game from hell. Do you know that with this program I can throw you into a scenario where there is a catastrophe just to see how you react to it, essentially gaining the ability to predict your next move? And as a result, I may be able to use that in ways that inform my intelligence. It synergizes and force multiplies my human intelligence, human, my signal intelligence, SIGINT, 
and my communications intelligence comment. Neurant coupled with assessment and access gives me said capabilities. But I can also begin to utilize this for intelligence acquisition in different ways. I can, for example, utilize neuropharmacologics and various forms of brain stimulation to be able to extract information from key intelligence targets in ways that are far less deleterious and or harmful to said targets and as a result uphold a higher, if you will, moral conduct in the face of various forms of intelligence operation. Now that I've said that, I should tell you that this is not without argument. Because there are those that think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. The last sanctified space is that of my consciousness, and you're using this stuff to invade that? You're right. In order for them to build a cognitive model, they first have to force continually the victim into a, a, a set of responses over and over, day in and day out. You know, an endless set of counter moves, just trying to function and survive. Um, and, and that's how they measure, gauge the, effect, the effectiveness of their neural programming, etc. But also measure, map out and, and the, the mind control victim's brain into a cognitive model. What do I mean by a cognitive model? I mean that they're using trauma, physical and psychological trauma, to map out your brain. To map out the sensory and neural pathways of your brain and central nervous system. Moreover, we can also utilize something called Titan, which is tiered integrated tracking and access networks that utilize biologically implantable chips to then track key individuals in a variety of circumstances and then yoke these to known information about the way brains work to create narratives and behaviors. And essentially what this does is this adds to what's called human terrain teaming. This feeds back to an older idea called naked man approaching. In other words, I don't need to identify you by your uniform, by your clothes, but perhaps by certain anthropometric characteristics, and in this case, biological signatures. So the idea of indwelling biosensors that are able to then upload remotely. The brain activity of an individual is monitored and transmitted to a remote location by satellite for mapping and mastering the human domain. At the remote location, the monitored brain activity is compared with pre-recorded normalized brain activity curves, waveforms, or patterns to determine if a match or substantial match is found. If such a match is found, then the computer at the remote location determines that the individual was attempting to communicate a word, phrase, or thought corresponding to the match stored in the normalized signal. Telemetrized information is quite real. Those of you working in the area of biosensors, RFIDs, understand the potential power here. This is a key area for dual use because these types of sensors are being developed for populational monitoring of key biological variables that can be then uptaken into health inf information databases. The same type of thing can be used for other forms of information, not least of which is tracking and identification. The sentient world simulation does this automatically. So what this is is a synthetic mirror of the world we live in. Not a piece of it, but the entire world. And this program constantly recalibrates the simulation based on real-time world events, trends, theories, economics, industry, almost everything you can think of that would contribute to an accurate model. Not to mention the individual pieces of data on every single person represented in the simulation. So to put this in perspective, what this is, is a digital clone of our world and everyone in it. The idea to then be able to take a key individual set of biological metrics and immediately in real time pull them into a large scale data analytic to say, this is who this person is, and this is where this person's been, and this is who this person's been interacting with, could be very, very useful. The more we know, the bolder we go. Puts the brain at our fingertips. It also obviously opens the specter. It clearly opens a Pandora's box. You know, in many ways, a lot of what we're doing today in brain science is not only cutting edge within the sciences, but cutting edge for the knowledge base of humanity. We're going ever more boldly and ever more bravely into the brain as a final frontier of understanding, of engagement, and in some cases, of effect and manipulation. Biological knowledge multiplied by computing power multiplied by data equals the ability to hack humans. And the AI revolution or crisis is not just AI, it's also bio biology, it's biotech. 
The Brain Initiative is a $6 billion fund to find new ways to map the activity of an entire brain. Leading neuroscientist Professor Raphael Yust was at the front of the queue for funding. We're not talking about data privacy. This is much worse. We're talking about the contents of your mind. And maybe I'll explain what it means, the ability to hack humans, to create an algorithm that understands me better than I understand myself and can therefore manipulate me, enhance me, or replace me. The goal of the Brain Initiative is precisely to build methods to read and manipulate the activity of neural circuits. I'm a former naval officer. I'm a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. I have a degree in control systems engineering. I worked as a surface warfare officer in electronics warfare and nuclear engineering jobs. While I was in the service, I found out there's an ongoing, non-consensual human experiment, and it's testing a human-machine interface weapon. And of course, part of that program is Obama's Brain Initiative, a multi-billion dollar program. DARPA's got a huge chunk of that. A billion dollars, a billion dollars to map the brain. But you see, once you map the brain, then you can begin to connect the mind to computers. The new program is called Neural Engineering System Design, or NESD, which aims to develop an implantable neural interface connecting humans directly to computers. Philip Elvelde, NESD manager for DARPA, said its goal was to upgrade the tools that we have to really open the channel between the human brain and modern electronics. At the moment, human-computer interfaces are able to connect between a hundred and a thousand brain neurons to a machine at the time. DARPA aims to refine this technology to connect individual neurons. This would give much finer control, reduce noise, and speed up communications between a human and a computer. So basically, they're, they look at you as essentially a computer that they can hack. That's why they're talking about brain hacking. That's why they're talking about their RAM program. You should be very concerned if they were genuinely concerned about medical issues, and of course, that's not at all what the Defense Department and DARPA are focused on. They're about creating war machines, okay? They're not about doing medical research. If they had any real concern about the veterans, they would be doing something for them in just ordinary care at the VA. So you should be very skeptical of anything that they tell you. If they do come up with a treatment, will they make it available to the vets? I seriously doubt it. They're always saying they're going to do that. We should remember the history of what they did to World War II veterans with PTSD. They gave them lobotomies. DARPA's website confirms the news, also citing that among the program's potential applications are devices that could compensate for deficits in sight or hearing by feeding digital auditory or visual information into the brain at a resolution and experiential quality far higher than possible with current technology. Considering that DARPA's research has an end goal of military application, it's not hard to imagine where that could be used. And of course, they're being joined by Lawrence Livermore National Labs. They have, get this, high fidelity neural recordings. They're trying to do everything they can to map and to record your memory. It's not enough for them to record all of our metadata, not enough for them to record all of our phone conversations, as the former head of the NSA said. He said they want total population control. That's how you do it with these brain projects. Out of disclosure, some of the work that I'm doing here today is funded by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. I'm also funded by the European Union Human Brain Project, specifically the Subproject 12, where I'm a task leader for dual-use brain science. And I've also done some ongoing work with the Strategic Multi-Level Assessment Crew over the past 10 years at the Pentagon, at Dr. Kavayan's group, and with DARPA. The brain is not a large organ. It literally fits in the palm of your hands. More and more contemporary brain science is putting the brain, and its functions, consciousness, the mind, emotion, behavior, at our fingertips. If we look at an organ that fits in the palm of our hands as the brain does within its folds, crevices, within its depth and billions of cells and trillions of connections, it's every hope you've ever had, every dream, every nightmare, everything you love, everything you hate everything you remember, everything you'll plan to be, from birth to the grave. And more than that, perhaps more expansively, the organ that fits beneath our skulls and here within the palm of our hands is the essence of everything that humanity has ever done and will ever be. All of our excellences, all of our evils, all of our benefits, all of our burdens, all of our help and all of our harms from this little organ. The military, you know, they pioneered the internet, DARPA, and now they are pioneering 
uh, our interface to our brain. And if you think the internet is big, if you think blockchain is big, this is going to blow it all away. Because there's nothing bigger than connecting our minds to the internet. The hardware that's coming out right now, literally as we speak, is going to blow open the doors for this. We're going to get to a whole new level. Note, this has not been directly addressed, nor has it been entertained by any United States government entity in a public forum. What has gone from the drawing board to the reality is this. The use of neural interfacing and physiological interfacing through the idea of remote controlled small scale systems to create a nano swarm of biopenetrable materials that you cannot see that can penetrate all but the most robust biochemical filters that are able to integrate themselves through a variety of membranes, mucous membranes in wherever, mouth, nose, ears, eyes, and they can be done in such a level that their presence is almost impossible to detect and as such the attribution becomes exceedingly difficult to demonstrate. The idea here is to put minimal sized electrodes in a network within a brain through only minimal intervention to be able to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. And by affecting the way that brain is built and the way it functions, influence in ways that are kinetic and non-kinetic the attitudes, beliefs, thoughts, emotions, activities, and relative vulnerabilities and predispositions of those individuals for whom may threaten us. It used to be that I need to be exceedingly close to someone to now influence them with a weapon, and now what we see is we create both distal potential as well as much more capable potential to affect them in a variety of different ways. All of us speak to ourselves in our head. That's how we, it's strange that we have to communicate to ourselves by speaking, right? But we will just sit there talking to ourselves. So as we are talking, there's a certain pattern for every word we say. What they're doing is looking at the pattern in the brain, and then they're matching that pattern, uh, they're putting that into a database. If you think of those words, and the, the beauty of this is there's, there, you know, most of the words in the dictionary we don't say. But a, a subset of these words, actually a small subset, we use all the time. So if you can match the patterns in somebody's brain to the, to the, uh, to the patterns in the database, you can literally start to read their mind. Every time a word comes up, you know it. Oh, that word came up for that individual. Now, will the patterns be identical in every person? Probably not, though the information will be stored in slightly different places. But it wouldn't take long for you to train a machine to read your mind. Now, that's just the beginning. They may be able to have algorithms sophisticated enough, and they get enough samples, enough data, that, it, that the, the, the AI could actually learn over time uh, uh, what the general rules are for different words, and then you could apply it to anybody. See, nano cells are real small, a thousand times smaller than these dust particulates. You inhale it, they go to work replicating, spreading like a virus, multiplying in exponentials. Six months' time, I could have a hundred million people converted ditch diggers, porn stars, and presidents. Not one would be the wiser. A hundred million people who buy what I want them to buy and do pretty much damn well anything I figure they ought to do. We will have nanobots that we can feed into our brain that directly connect to the cloud. Uh, we will connect wirelessly our neocortex to the cloud. This will replace the internet. It'll become a brain net. And the whole agenda is for um, humanity to have technology put inside the body, inside the brain. Um, nanotechnology will connect the human mind to the cloud. In a way, the future shapes the now. Think of a world where all things are connected, a world with artificial intelligence everywhere. This is the vision that leads us to the cloud. The cloud has become a force of its own. 
A group of scientists say we are closer than ever to creating technology which can emerge with human biology in order to access the cloud in real time. And they mentioned something called deep learning where the CIA is getting technology from Amazon. The company has signed a $600 million deal with the CIA and Daily Finance reports it doesn't have anything to do with buying books. Amazon will help the agency build a private cloud infrastructure to keep up with emerging technologies. This deal would be a game changer for both the CIA and Amazon. Bloomberg reports the pairing would innovate new uses for cloud technology. This level of technology could include brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, brain-to-computer interfaces, and specifically brain-to-cloud interfaces. Technology linking the brain to the cloud could drastically alter the state of communications between humans and machines. The senior author of the study noted that once inside the brain, the devices would then wirelessly transmit encoded information to and from a cloud-based supercomputer network for real-time brain state monitoring and data extraction. Essentially, the CIA is attempting to use artificial intelligence AI, and that's where all the focus, by the way, of these tech companies is right now, is into artificial intelligence to really control the population. And I know it sounds so Orwellian, it sounds science fiction even to say these things, and yet that has been the primary focus of companies like Amazon over the last few years. This deal would be a game changer for both the CIA and Amazon. Bloomberg reports the pairing would innovate new uses for cloud technology. It refers to using the cloud computing technology in a company's own data center because you know Amazon is better known for these public clouds where the hardware is shared with other users. The CIA has refused to comment on the deal, saying it doesn't publicly disclose details on its contracts. Amazon wouldn't talk either, and CNET's Charles Cooper says neither party probably ever will. Given how Amazon usually considers everything, including the state of the current weather in Seattle, as something of a state secret, odds are we'll never hear much more. I became a security specialist for SIS, specializing in executive protection, also risk and threat assessment uh, to our clients. Our clients are the companies or the individuals that we contract out with and provide services for. And it was in that context uh, that I became aware of uh, what I describe as a social engineering program and uh, a research and development program that was being carried out by SIS uh, and our clients in Seattle, uh, the Amazon Corporation. And I later learned that they were indeed experimenting with, when I say experimenting, voice to skull, hive mind, behavior modification technology that is frequency based and directed at a targeted individual to basically control their entire person. Once you have connected the targeted individual with the frequency um, and they resonate together, then you have a perfect uh, avenue upon which to send and receive information back and forth. And that's exactly how they manipulate someone's thoughts. They send voices into someone's head. Uh, they manipulate their emotions, they manipulate their behavior, and then that's also how they receive back from the Id individual in real time uh, the vital signs, the emotions, the thoughts, uh, what the person's seeing, what the person's hearing, and then all that information, of course, is rendered on a computer elsewhere uh, via software, and it can be monitored and tracked in real time. The next thing that is really interesting is, you know, everybody's talking about augmented reality and VR right now. If uh, you've taken uh, any drugs like LSD, suddenly uh, the, uh, it becomes real, right? Our minds are actually doing AR or VR, right? Putting dragons in the room and creating like all this stuff. We're able to, the point is, we are able to do that with our brains as they exist right now. So there's no need for external hardware. Once we tap into the brain, our minds itself can actually cre create overlays of AR and VR. If we have algorithms that stimulate the right things and give it the right data, we could literally see a screen pop up. And we call it hallucinating, right? But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms that would give us everything AR would without any glasses, without any contact lenses. This technology can be used to beam images and even motion pictures into one's brain. Images and motion pictures that are so realistic that you think you're actually watching a movie or seeing something in reality. It's like a virtual reality 3D rendering. 
that takes place within the target's mind. Let's imagine that we could take our brain out of our body and keep it alive in a glass box. Then let's get a computer filled with information related to a particular setting, such as image, sound, and smell. We'll connect this computer to the brain with electrodes and send the pre-recorded data to the brain. As our brain receives these signals, it will see and live the setting that the computer is transmitting. We could also send signals to the brain from this computer about our own image. For example, we could send the electrical information, such as the sight, hearing, and touch, that we would experience while sitting at a desk. Our brain would perceive that we were a businessman sitting in his office. This imaginary world would continue as long as the information kept coming from the computer and we would never realize that we were actually a brain sitting in a glass box. You can imagine us entering entirely living in the real world as we do now and also living in this virtual world uh, where they are combined in a, in, right inside our minds. Now, our minds are so amazing because did you know when you are looking at me now, when you look at me now, that what you are seeing is not really me. Now, what you are, your, your, eye, your eyes are not, your brain, it's not like a video camera. You're not getting a video feed. What you are doing is you are getting a sense of the room and your brain is recreating it in your head. So even the reality, and if you read enough books on the brain, which I've read way too many, <laughs> uh, you will understand that our minds are actually creating reality. And a lot of times, you know, you'll look and you'll see something and then you'll look again and it'll be a little different, the color or something else. It's because your brain is always changing it based on what it expects to be there. And that's because it's slow things are slow. Getting information in and out is slow. And your brain needs to react quickly. And, and it requires a lot of processing power. So your brain is actually fudging it to make, you know, vision requires a lot more processing power than audio, than hearing. So your brain, like what you hear is closer to reality than what you see. Because your brain is filling in all the gaps between uh, what is there what it, in reality and what your brain expects to be there. So my point is that as this technology emerges, uh, we will be creating our own new realities. So there will be a reality, like what we all live in now, is the reality of being these bodies that have been around, you know, that evolved over millions of years and, you know, been the same for over 100,000 years. We are entering that world of Neo-Sapiens where there is going to be a reality beyond anything any human being has experienced in the past. Patent number 6011991, remote brain computer interface neural monitoring, i.e. via satellite, directed not necessarily by human handlers, but by a computer system that sits on a global information grid in a network-centric environment. They can not only monitor your thoughts, but they can modify your behavior remotely. If our brains are connected to the internet, and if our brains are all connected, all of us connected, I could literally go into your head and see through your eye. So all of a sudden, like for a day, like, you know, a lot of us, because you're entrepreneurs, think it would be cool to go inside Elon Musk's head for a day and walk around. Well, Elon Musk may, out, may allow people to, to get that feed and literally live through what he sees. This technology can also tap into the optical nerve of the target and the auditory system of the target so that those monitoring the target can see what the target is seeing and hear what the target is hearing. This information is then downloaded and stored on a computer in a highly secure classified site on servers that are guarded by some of the tightest security in the world. This results in the individual's entire day, everything they see, everything they hear, everything they experience, 
and everything they feel being recorded till the end of time. If you're looking at connecting our brains to the internet, um, one of the things we'll be able to do is we'll be to outsource functions of our brain. So we'll be able to outsource, we'll be able to upload our memories to the cloud. So let's say you don't want to, you want that memory forever, right? You're like, it's automatically probably being stored in the cloud for you without you thinking about it. Just like these automatic backups on your computer, you know? Everything, there's a copy and there's redundancy and there's like many versions. <laughs> I was previously at the Institute for Neurocomputation at UCSD as well as with a number of members of my team and we were focusing really on brain computer interfaces and on advanced methods for neural state decoding to interpret the signals that come out of our brains and relate them to behavior and cognition. So we provide a RESTful API framework. Um, actually we're I think the world's first uh, platform for neurocomputation operating, operating on the cloud through a web API interface in real time. So you can push your biosignals to the cloud through a few API calls, then we have a large amount of sophisticated signal processing that's spun up to make sense of that data, and then with a few more lines of code through again a simple REST API, you can get back a meaningful result, and all that happening in real time. It's a, a scary proposition to think that every biosignal from us will be one day measured, but if it is, I'd like to know that, that I'm, I'm in control of that data and, and not the NSA. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Catherine Harridge continues her reporting on a place where all that data is headed. Bluffdale, Utah, 25 miles south of Salt Lake City, the NSA is nearing completion on a gargantuan new project. It's named the Utah Data Center. The NSA will neither confirm nor deny the specifics. But some estimate the center will be capable of storing five zettabytes of data, or enough to store every email, cell phone call, Google search and surveillance camera video in America for a very long time. All the NSA would tell us is that the Utah Data Center is a facility for the intelligence community that will have a major focus on cybersecurity. We weren't given access last summer, but we could see it from the sky. It's a really a, a turnkey situation where it can be turned quickly and become a totalitarian state pretty quickly. Um, the ca capacity is to do that is being set up. That's a chilling assessment from Bill Benny, who worked at the NSA for nearly four decades, starting as a data analyst in the days before desktop computers. Without verbalizing anything, you could literally start to talk, communicate with other people. So my lecture, we could all be standing here silent. I could just be communicating it to you. Uh, you. I could be talking, you would talk to people, they could be, you could literally have conversations with people without ever getting on your phone anywhere in the world. You know, good, goodbye WeChat or Google Hangouts. <laughs> we could all just be on our brainwaves, right? Communicating with our friends, they could be dropping in on us. Very strange if we think about it. So that when that person goes to speak out about it, when they go to seek help from their fellow human beings, and their fellow human beings say, what is it that's happening to you? The target will then say, I'm hearing voices inside my head. But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms. And they will conclude that this person must be crazy. And as a result, they will recommend psychological evaluation for that person. You can see the way this is going to go and the way it is going right now. As good people, helpless people that are being abused and tortured and enslaved and experimented upon in America today, American citizens cry out for help from their fellow Americans and their fellow Americans say, why don't you take some Prozac because we think you're schizophrenic. Well, this is a highly technical program all of the symptoms are induced by a technology that is so fucking sophisticated it is horrifying beyond description it, we call it hallucinating right but these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms that would give us everything AR would without any glasses uh, it, it, the system then 
takes those, those algorithms and, and, and correlates uh, communication and behavior data. When I say communication and behavior data, what I'm referring to is impulses and identifiers. Okay? Um, and then uh, that brain activity is then sampled, uh, remotely measured, and, and then integrated back into RNM data um, uh, for the purposes of uh, you know, creating a cognitive model of the victim's brain. But as soon as we connect our brains to the Internet, there's emotions are also data. We could start literally to feel somebody else's pain. And now we say, I feel your pain. We don't really feel their pain. But in the future, we may actually really feel their pain. Like if they're sad, all of a sudden we could tap in, you know, to your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend, and you could be like, oh my God, I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel your anxiety, you know? This technology can also be used to manipulate the emotions of the target. It can induce fear, love, hate. It can cause you to be nervous, it can cause you to be confident, it can cause you to be depressed, it can cause you to be happy, it can cause you to feel any fucking emotion at any time by artificially inducing them. <laughs> so, you know, like any technology, uh, there are great things we could do, and then there are very horrible things that could result from it that are unanticipated. Now, if somebody hacks into your cell phone or your bank account, they can steal your identity. But it's not your real identity. It's more like your money. <laughs> and that's bad enough, right? That's pretty bad if you get hacked um, and they steal your, you know, they do identity theft. But if, they're, if, they're connected, if your brain is connected directly to the internet, then it will be real identity theft. They could take you. They could literally erase you. They could reprogram you in a way without you even knowing it. So every, you think you're in control of your own will, but it's actually somebody else. It can literally stop your own thoughts from happening and replace them with other thoughts uh, by sending thoughts to your head. And it's so sophisticated that you cannot tell where these thoughts are coming from. There's no way to, to discern that they're coming from somewhere other than your own mind. So you can imagine how bad this would be for people that don't even realize this technology exists and they're having these thoughts which they think are spontaneous because uh, being under the influence of this technology now, kind of having been on both sides of it, I am, I am just amazed um, at the way it works and I know that the thoughts that they beam into your head originate from the exact same place in your mind that your own natural thoughts originate from. So if I didn't know I was under the influence of this technology, then I would have no idea that anyone was influencing my thoughts at all. And that's exactly what it can be used for. It can be used to sway people in terms of their opinion, to make them go along with a certain agenda. It can be used to turn groups of people or individuals against each other uh, for whatever purpose. And who do we trust with this technology? Well, apparently not Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> He didn't do that good a job at protecting our data, <laughs> you know? Do we trust a government? Do we trust uh, Donald Trump? <laughs> do we trust, who do we trust? Yeah, decentralized, a blockchain, right? There's, you, uh, you're gonna have to have technology uh, that protects us. Technology which really doesn't exist today, and it has to be so foolproof, and we have to have so much faith in it, that we're willing to open up our brains to that potential of being hacked. So, my final slide here is that, you know, our future could go two ways, right? We could literally create heaven on earth. So we are all one giant being and we are all working in unison and we are experiencing these amazing things. Or it could be hell, where there's some evil AI or evil people controlling everything we do and we're more like zombies, you know? Where we don't even know it. Like we think we're free and we're not actually free. One of the things I'm concerned about is the technology as it's being researched and developed in Seattle utilizes emotion manipulation and behavior manipulation uh, without the gang stalking and without the voice to skull aspects. And so this use of the technology 
can be done very covertly to the point where the person it's being used against will not know that this technology is being used against them. And that is one of my main concerns and one of the reasons why I want to bring more light to this technology and to this issue because this technology could potentially be, be being used against tens to hundreds of millions of Americans every day. I rec I, um, mention in some of my podcasts how there are field effects where they will not direct this technology at an individual but create a general field of frequency in a geographical area so that everybody that within that geographical area is feeling the effects of the technology it's more of a general application of the technology instead of an individual specific application of the technology but when you consider that use of it and the fact that it is used for emotion and thought and behavior modification that we could potentially be looking at many, many millions of people across the country that are under the influence of the technology uh, today, right now. It's going to be very hard to stop. It is going to be very hard to stop. Think about it. You know, it's sort of a one-way path. I've never seen humanity roll back technology. What we can do is control it. So like with nuclear weapons, we barely kept those in control, you know, with other weapons. Not so much, um, like chemical weapons, but we, we need to start talking about this now. Every single man, woman, and child in the United States of America will be under the influence of this technology. And as you can see going forward, what's going to happen is a, is a dividing line is going to be drawn in America. And it's not going to be Democrat or Republican or black and white, rich, poor, you know, Jew, Gentile, religious differences, whatever it is, it's going to be based on who is on the right and the wrong side of this technology, who is on the right and the wrong side of this program. And so if you are not a part of this program, then there is a very real risk that you are going to become a full-blown, 24-7 targeted individual. And this technology at that point when it is nationwide will be used by automated computer, supercomputer software programming. Uh, that will manipulate the emotions and the behavior and the thoughts of everybody in the United States of America. And it can all be done remotely. It's very much like the, the microchip kind of uh, tracking the New World Order, this entire, you know, uh, control grid that's supposed to be rolled out against the American people someday. And I'm here to tell you that uh, it's already here. There isn't going to come a day where there's troops in the streets and tanks rolling down uh, your neighborhood and riot gear and all this stuff. We might have isolated incidents like that. It might get that like that every once in a while. But the, the true control grid is this technology, voice to skull, hive mind, behavior manipulation technology. And it can all be done remotely. It can be done simply by targeting you with the frequency, locking into the resonant frequency of your DNA and your mind, and in that manner completely track and trace and control you uh, 24 hours a day.